happy. You cannot run for Stay involved. Who is that guy? Was it Coolio? Somebody, <laughs> somebody was doing an interview and he was talking about how he, you know, the secret to success, you know, just stay involved. Even if you're not all into the academics, just like stay involved in activities because usually when kids stop doing activities, they get involved in drugs or gangs or just hanging out, you know, with the wrong people whatever just stopping caring true. stopping caring even about your own life you know all right I'm just playing so with this. What is the topic of discussion? um well i was just going to ask you of like seven or eight questions about and you can talk as long or as little as you want but just wanted to hear what you have to say your impressions of Probably gonna have to prop it back, but um, you know your experience on the turf. Um, the, for the me, first, it's think. important. Uh, we're, we're, for me, because um, I have to figure out if this is even because I might be filming your crotch right now. Um, <laughs> okay. Okay, you can't. I can't see you at back. all because you're backlit. Oh, oh, that's perfect. Good deal. Are you okay? Like, are you okay. comfortable that way? It's kind of cool to have, like, the... Of course, the sun will go down a little bit, so it'll be kind of sweet. Look at the plastic bag. Can you squish that down? Oh, okay. All right. All right, that's cool. Cool. Um, uh, where's my paper go? There it is. No, yeah, so the reason that I'm interested is because, like I already told you before, in 2004 when I worked for ACT, um, I feel like way too formal, and I feel like I'm on CBS or something. Um, in 2004 when I worked for ACT, it was just weird because they never really talked about it, but we had two separate bands. We had one that was all African American, the other band was mostly white. We had a couple, you know, people of color in that band, but it was pretty much split up. You know, the black band went to the rural urban neighborhood that was mostly black in Columbus, which is cool. I understand where they're going, but like, they're in my you mind. more suitable for reaching people, having them be responsive to you in that area. That's the demographic that they think will appeal to. That's the area that they'll put you in. Right. I don't know if that's right or wrong. Because I've seen that happen to me time and time again. Like, if they know that we're going to lower Price Hill in a predominantly low income area, that's, you know, a lot of people like um, Ryan, Floyd, myself, would be good. Mm -hmm. Is this uh, recording now? It is, sir. Yeah. Well, in my experience, we start from the catalyst in the first place, which is why I started canvassing in the first place, which is, I always head into a lot of BS. Like the epitome of a self-destructive lifestyle. And I did a complete 180. You know, that's why I told you earlier you can't put a price on acknowledgement. You know, because I consider myself. I may not be like a very social person, but on a good day I can interact with almost anyone. You know, um, I have the perfect balance, I believe, of scholastic smarts mm -hmm. and street smarts and common sense all the way. Doubt me, they believe that sometimes you can interact with anyone or not. So, for the most part, I can, which is why when I was looking for a job, I came back to Cincinnati and I was looking for a job. I was with my mom, I was sleeping on her food time in the living room. She was nice enough to tell me, Well, don't worry about paying rent or anything like that. You know, just get yourself a job, save yourself some money, and just do the best that you can do for yourself. Because you know? I know you'll succeed. She secretly likes me the most out of our. Uh, I kid you not. But, um, How many siblings? I have an older brother, Kevin, and a younger brother, Chris. So I'm the epitome of a little, little child. But, um, yeah. It was funny that in Bond Hill, of all places, it was just impossible to find a job. Almost impossible. Like, even at like... Where is Bond Hill? Bond Hill is in the Paddock Road vicinity. Mm. You know, and uh, I lived right on Paddock Road. You know, and there was like an overabundance of McDonald's, Wendy's churches, all these places to go potentially get a job, any crap job, something that'll pay your rent, and a, pl 
flying every single place, and I can network. You know, I can present myself. I clean up pretty nice when I like to. Yeah. You know, and um, I just could not find work. You know, and it wasn't me. It's just people like would hire me because they really like my demeanor. You know, the way I present myself. And, oh man, you gotta come in for an interview. Um, we'll set you up whatever day. I'll get there, and their superior will tell me like, you know, I'm sorry we let you on. Like, but we're currently overstaffed right now. We just really can't afford to hire one. I'm really sorry you came in. You seem like a really great guy. I really like that to work here. But I, I can't. I just can't. You know, it was a serious downer. And this happened. It seriously happened. So I'm leaving an interview I have just been turned down from. And while en route home, I run into Cassie and Kevin Johnson. They were canvassing my area, doing membership sign. And um, she looked at Cassie comes up to me. How long ago was this? This was May 1st, 2008. This year? Yes, May 1st, 2008. And uh, she told me about why they were out there fighting to keep jobs in Cincinnati and the U.S. because Dayton, its neighboring areas, pretty much Southwest Ohio is number two for unemployment. Somewhere in the ballpark of a quarter of the jobs have been lost in this half decade. You know, and I tell her, well, you know, I'm first-hand proof of the BS that people are going through in regards to job loss, and I would love the opportunity to work with you guys. Now, I didn't know they got paid to do it. They just said, well, you seem like a really smart kid. Take the number down to the office, call Gordon, and um, talk to Gordon, talk to Brandon. And um, I talked to Gordon. He set me up with my interview. And um, actually, I applied online first, actually. I applied online, and um, I gave an extensive... Um, reason as to why I'd like to work there because before I ever nice. ran into those two, I have a friend named Michael Landon and he is really big into like Infowars.com, staying politically aware. His only problem is that he's really lazy. You know, he's like one of those idiots of He has all this knowledge but doesn't uh, think yeah. I didn't want to be the same kind of person because the information I acquired from him was, you know, it was shocking and to be potentially be part of a movement that could, you know, rage against the machine would be awesome, you know what I mean? And uh, I applied online and I hadn't heard from him, but um, I actually found my packet, so I called the office after about a week or two, and Gordon says, man, we've been waiting for you to call, man, come in today. I come in and uh, did my observation day, aced it, I uh, canvassed with Ashley Fyshe, she was my trainer, and uh, it was really good, just the energy, the message, like, to work with such an eclectic range of people was phenomenal. And even if nobody like, even if nobody absolutely loved you, no one disliked anyone because you're all there for the same kind of purpose, which is really great. But it has been in my experience after about about 30 days of canvassing, it became apparent to me that it wasn't just a job; it, it's a lifestyle. Canvassing is, you know. Like, yeah. Any one person, you just can't take on that job. Expect to keep that job. If you don't, if you want it, you keep it. If you don't really want to, then you won't. It's just that simple. But there are intricacies to it that blow me away. Like, I wouldn't really know where to begin. I initially didn't even know I could get paid. I didn't know I got paid. Uh, I kid you not, a month went by, and uh, I believe it was Corey Kane comes up and like, dude, you've had a check here for about three weeks. When are you going to sign it out? <laughs> I got a check, I, I get paid? He was like, yeah, <laughs> you get paid, bro. I was just volunteering because I was just going to take foot to ass in regards to the fact that you know, people like myself in growing numbers just couldn't find work at a whole the wall, jack in the box, what have you. And um, realizing the wages wasn't what really kicked me into high gear as far as canvassing it was the people that I worked with. You know, the, the money was just a super sweet side bonus. But when you talk to someone at a door, realizes the severity of how people can't get health care. You know, there's 47 to 49 million people without health care. You know, eight, eight, don't know. Or so are kids. That resonates with a lot of people. And it's, the, it's so few and far between where someone like myself who doesn't have a high school degree, isn't a college graduate, can have a job that you are genuinely proud of. Mm, yeah. You know, that, that's a phenomenal thing, you know. To have the respect of my friends, I mean, at least, and I really have this affinity for understatements, so you have to respect that, but I am a reforming moron, okay? 
<laughs> I am such a phenomenally bright person. Stranger after stranger after stranger has told me that, you know, I need to live up to my potential. And until as of late, I wasn't. But this was the catalyst for that. I've been doing well making, you know, progress in regards to that. But work in America and canvassing really, like, brought me into the spot where I wasn't taking any steps backwards for once, you know. Because I was so proud of what I was doing. Proud of people I was working with, especially you. You're a great dude, man. I really, I really appreciate you. And uh, oh, come on, don't. I'm, not, I'm not kidding, man. I really do. Anybody who could put themselves aside, physically exhaust themselves for a cause like this, has my respect. Yeah. But uh, I have experienced the demographic differences. They tell you not to be turf headed, but it's kind of hard not to sometimes. But I turf what? Headed? Turf headed. Oh, like, um, never heard that term. Well, like you go into a predominantly, as they would say, bouge kind of an area, and you <laughs> automatically assume you know you're gonna catch hell out here, or you go into a low income area because during membership sign up, you know, low income areas during membership recruitment, low income areas were great because you could always get at least 35 members. I mean, the staff quota was 28 members and three DPMs. DPM is a dues-paying member. Right. You had to get three people a day to give you $5. And, uh, you know, it was really hard to get dues-paying members in a low-income area, but you could always get a lot of members. Yeah. It was very much vice versa in higher-income areas. You could always get donations. Mm. But you usually couldn't get too many members because mm. not too many people in these predominantly higher-income areas weren't too keen on unions, you know? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, unions have screwed the pooch in a lot of ways, but it's, to me, a fact that without unions, you know, things would be a lot worse. And that's me not wanting to delve too intricate into the union yeah. stuff, because we all know that. But as far as um, racial issues, crying out loud, it's really wild to me to have a really cute white sides partner. And uh, me being me to go into a really high scale, predominantly Republican, epitome of a red state kind of a town, mm -hmm. and have my sides partner just getting like five dollar check after five dollar check, twenty dollar wow. check, two bucks here, two bucks there. They come back with thirty two members and like eight or ten DPMs. I got six members and like a handful of change. Like, it blew me away when we teed off on the street. That person would go down a block, make a right. i go down a block, make a left. And we'd meet up at the far end. And uh, when I when they saw us together, it was just that much more tolerable that I was knocking on the door to get something with my side partner. But once I went off on my own, when people would see me, because a lot of people would be on their porches and stuff like that, they would literally go inside, shut the barn, shut the doors, call their friends, because, you know, it's a close-knit area. Most people in the areas like that know each other. They were probably, most likely I figured out, were calling each other like, hey, you got some dude coming down the block. He's going to knock on your door. Probably ask you for something. Rah, 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 rah. And it reminds me, um, if you've never seen Simpsons the movie, watch it. And you'll see what I mean. In the Simpsons movie, uh, Lisa Simpson is um, doing canvassing about the environment. Yeah? I didn't know I missed that one. She's but... canvassing in the movie. You gotta and see um, that. she knocks on the door and gets the door slammed in her face. Knocks on the door and gets the door slammed in her face. Knocks on the door and gets the door slammed in her face. And then everybody just zip, zip, slam, slam, slam. Actually, there was a guy who had a houseboat. He just takes off. It's, it's terrible. You know, and it, I can't say that it doesn't break your demeanor a little bit, but mm. considering the cause, knowing that not every day is going to be the same, I try not to let it affect me because, you know, I'm blessed with the ability to let things go easily. You know, things that are trivial to me. And somebody else's ignorance, I mean, on top of that, you have to take, in, have to take, in, take into consideration that nobody owes you their time. You know, that is one thing that kept me from, like, you know, folding the fact that you knock on somebody's door, dude. They have every right to be a prick to you. But I like to think me being such a phenomenal person, as much as I think I am, that people will be more responsive to me. And if most yeah. people, see, yeah. the thing is, though, the people that do hear me out are always the ones that change my demeanor for the positive. I mean, I can have 30 doors slammed in my face, but to talk to that one person after an hour 
have them genuinely sit down and meet and not just, you know, let the things I say resonate, but then genuinely, genuinely respect not just me, but everyone else in the organization and everyone out there, knowing that people in my generation aren't so apathetic, you know, yeah. aren't so ignorant, because I wanted to print a shirt that says, ignorance and apathy are a dangerous combination. It's on a par with drinking and driving. Yeah. You know, nice. well so said. I really nice, especially someone of my ethnicity, to be acknowledged from somebody in a predominantly Republican area, and thank not just me, but everyone in the organization, everyone in my generation, for caring and attempting. Because even if we would have failed at what we tried to accomplish, you know it's better to try and fail than to not try at all. And to be part of that is something phenomenal. I'm going to take things away from this job that I will utilize for the rest of my life. Not all the time, but when it's important, the next time I go with a resume into a job interview, the next time I'm surrounded by people I don't know in a party, you know, it, like, there are really key elements as regards of um, targeting. Targeting is asking for something and getting it. It could be a cigarette, it could be a bottle of water, it could be a bag of chips, it could be a baby. You never mm-hmm. know. But it depends on what you need that day, a pencil, a pen, whatever. But just being a good person, it's not too hard to let that demeanor rub off on other people, even if you don't talk to me. Because I'm really empathic. Sometimes I read people better than I talk to them. Oh, yeah. I read eyes, I read body language. Sometimes I swear I can hear people's thoughts even if I don't know them. You know, like I can tell when I uh, see somebody 10 yards away at a door how they're going to respond to me. But what was really cool is that when I didn't let somebody's demeanor break me, I stayed really positive. Sometimes I canvas during membership recruitment so loud, my rap was so positive and so loud, people would hear me five hours down yeah. and just come outside and just come to that guy's door. Like, you kidding me? Is that what you're showing people up for? But it, it, it was good, man, and I'm really, really, really going to miss it when the campaign picks back up. I'm definitely, definitely going to be there. You know, hopefully I'll see some familiar faces, you know, because there's never not going to be a need for us. I wish there wasn't a need for canvassers, but at the same time, I'm glad that we're here. Mm. And I'm glad that everybody cares to do it. And um, it's usually not even about the endorsed candidates, you know. It's about you. Your, your friends, your family, me, my family, my my future son, my grandson, and my great grandson. It's about whatever is the catalyst and daughters. for and daughters. Absolutely, I'm more than likely gonna have daughters. <laughs> whatever is the catalyst for a better social standing. Amen to that. Yeah, I was you're just here. blessed, man. So you're not gonna try and and uh, root out some of these. Um, other canvassing jobs like with the um, um, like, um, Ohio, Ohio Action, action. So I would absolutely action. love to if I could keep canvassing 365 days a year I would just because yeah. this is like I said this has turned out to be what I really like to do it's not something that would turn into a career but as far as jobs go for someone in my position my age my ethnicity the whole ball of wax considering talent. the talent the talent exactly this is a way for me to utilize what I'm good at. And I was really nervous before I came in for my interview. My mom told me, you are my son, and I know you. You have a phenomenal gift to interact with people, and I know you'll do well. And she couldn't have been more right. I just wish I could convey how I genuinely am to the people that don't know Because there are a lot of people in that office that are going to leave not knowing how good of a person that I am, that kind of bothers me in a way. You know, because I don't, I don't like making the wrong impression. I do get very self-conscious, especially at doors sometimes when I'm in a predominantly Republican area. But I don't want to be, I don't ever want to not be myself. I consider myself, I'm not a chameleon. I'm like all things to all people, though, you know? Well, it's part of having emotional intelligence. Yeah. That's where the find yourself being empathic, you know how to read people, so that way you can focus on them rather than me, me, me. People, people like to see themselves in what you're talking about. So you'll turn people on by being interested in them. And you figured that out naturally. And if I could just add a little tool, you know, I'm, I graduated uh, from college, you know, I have a BA from a really nice college. And I studied psychology, you know, um, you I'm definitely 
blessed to have that opportunity. Mm-hmm. Where'd you go to school? At Earlham College. It's a Quaker college in Richmond, Indiana. Super liberal, lots of activists, peace activists, really awesome professors that are there to really teach. Yeah, no, ask me, whatever. This is not, this is not a formal interview uh, by any means. And um, so one of the most important things that I learned not only in class, actually I learned more of this after college, learning things on my own and reading books on my own, um, that people who, I don't want to like zoom out and give like too much background, too much information, but basically what you see, this it's more common for someone who is of color and has learned to deal with people of different races, different ethnicities, different cultures. And often they found that exposure to social complexity, like the more, the more people, the more types of people that you're around the, that aren't like you, um, as long as you've had good experiences or okay experiences, you're often way ahead of the game when it comes to empathy, to understanding people, to talking to people, to networking, to, you know, getting ahead in that type of game or careers that take that sort of, um, that knowledge. I mean, and personally, that even comes to, to gay people, like people who have gender, you know, who aren't the stereotypical genders. Even those people, they have to learn how to get along with the dominant culture as well as the subcultures with themselves. They have to do a lot of introspection, like what does it mean to be good? What does it mean to be bad? Like, am I bad? Are you good? You know, who's good? Who's good? Who's bad? What is it? All that. So, you know, it, it's it's a gift, and that's one of the things that I'm glad to hear you talk about is that you realize your gifts and your talents. And in this new market that people are talking about, you know, pay attention to that. I've, I was just doing some Google searches the other day on jobs and like watching YouTube videos on uh, job hunting. And in the new, new, this new century, the, the jobs, the good jobs, the like leadership roles in the career field are going to go to the people who have high emotional intelligence who can deal with diversity, who can lead people, who can inspire people, who can get people riled up. You know, that's that's the new market. So, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I'm glad that you're proud of your talents and, and that you know you've got them, you know? I just really feel bad for the people that don't. <laughs> I mean, no, I'm serious. I was looking, I was at the bus stop um, maybe three or four days ago. And there was a gentleman walking by me. He was a dark skinned brother, real, real um, husky. He looked like a textbook prison inmate, like an ex con. And um, he spoke really less than, less than, uh, less than perfect practice, we'll say that. And he was a good guy, he was like broken English. Yeah, he was, he was using Real street urban language. Cow, cat, yeah. you know, but he really was putting a lot of emphasis on how important it was that he find a job. Because, you know, he's got kids to feed, you know, he's got, you know, everything like everyone else has to take care of. He, he has a life to lead. Yeah. He couldn't find work, you know. And it really pained me to see that somebody like himself and there are people like him in, in, in the millions that are just uneducated. I'm not just talking about African Americans, I'm talking about Caucasian, Asian, I mean, there's uneducated people and droves and it's just sad that, you know, I wish I could like instill that sense in him. Well, that, I mean, that's a thing, you know, being raised in a you know majorly Republican family and mostly Republican area, and even spending several summers in Alabama, and hearing my dad, who can be very bigoted in his language um, and sort of two-faced in how he treats people when it comes to race issues, um, you know, 
he, as most Republicans will, talk about, oh, education is a key to success, and like it's it's this two step equation. Like you go to school, and then suddenly you can do all. You know that guy that you saw on the street corner. He may have a co- he could have a college education, but you know he may have a high school education, or he may not. But it's something that. He may have that intelligence inside him, but he may not understand that what he wants, i.e. steady income, being able to support your kids, he may not have put two and two together with, oh, if I can speak more than one language, talk to more than one type of person in their language, it's like, it's not like you have to rebuke your own how you were raised. You don't have to totally like... And it's not even being two faced. Like some people were no, dogging Obama for speaking a little bit differently when he was talking with his brother. No, that's because he knows how to relate to different demographics. I found myself doing it all the time in the field, and you know what, man? It helped me out. I had a lot easier time. When I go into a predominantly low income area, a real urban area, you know, I drop some of my formalities while still remaining respectful. You know, I don't you know, uh, necessarily put on a facade or that, but, you know, when I'm talking to somebody, they always say, hey, you're sorry to find you jobs, you know, it's absolutely very there's a number of million jobs, spitting out facts, keeping it really real with them, but my demeanor in a predominantly um, Republican area, I'm bright, chipper, but at the same time, it's just because sometimes it's just the way it is, unfortunately so, it's just the way it is. Now, my thing is, though, in regards to that, is a problem that I had with a guy last week. You heard about what happened with Eric? No, but I've, someone told me, and I wanted to hear. <laughs> oh, and the see, thing is, though, is that I've had this problem as far back as I can remember. When I was still in Detroit, you know. Do I know Eric? Eric um, was one of our final four guys. I know he was let go. Eric Mix was... A white dude. No, he was a black dude. Black he dude. was a dark skinned black dude, real urban cap, um, cornrow braids, fitted ball cap, baggy jeans, always wore coochie hoodies. Uh, okay. had a gold right here. Yeah. He was cool though. He's a really cool guy. But um him and Tom Moore were in my van and um I was their FM that day. I actually got to lead a crew that day. And I'll be damned if at five thirty we're supposed to canvas. Oh no, you can keep talking. We're supposed to canvas until 645, 650. Um, I get a call from uh, Eric and Tom at about 530. They're saying they don't, they want to quit. They're done. They're over canvassing. They ain't got no water. They don't have any food. You know, that um, their water and food was gone after like 20 minutes. You know, and I told them about targeting. You know, I have to ask them for something and getting it. You know, you're talking to, you know, 95%. Um, Senator Obama supporters, you know, you just want to make sure if they're going to get out to the poll. It is not going to be difficult for you to introduce yourself, let them know why you're out there. And you just simply ask them for, can you mind refilling my bottle of water? That'd be greatly appreciated. It's just that simple. And that applies to anything if you need it, you know. And uh, he said, oh, I'm not comfortable doing that now. I'm a Mississippi dog. I don't feel comfortable asking no total stranger for something from them like that. Or, or, uh, I was like, you know what, man? As your field manager, like, when he was all riled up like that, I just stayed positive and I stayed progressive. You know, I never broke my tone. I was just, you know, like, you know what, man? As your FM, I'm responsible for you. I want to make sure that you are my priority. I'm going to call the office. I'll talk to the vote. Uh, Gordon and Brandon, I'll see what we can do. Just, um, you and Eric can hang tight, stay at the drop, and um, I'll call you back in a little bit. So, um, I get a hold of Gordon So, were they saying they were done earlier? They just need to... They Go said they to were the over. Like, man, we've been out here for two hours, man. We over it. We ain't camping no more, bro. It's been two and a half hours. Oh, okay. Y'all didn't tell me y'all were going to just drop us off and leave us out there and knock on doors for two and a half, three hours. <laughs> so they just weren't fit out and cut out for canvassing. That ended up right. being the uh, general consensus. Okay. But the thing is, though, it's that um, I talked to Gordon, talked to John Bo, worked everything out. They said, well, keep canvassing. The time you're supposed to canvass. Let them know you're just going to have to hang tight for about an hour. So I'll call them back, let them know, like, man, I'm going to get to you as soon as I can, at the earliest, 45 minutes, and at the latest, an hour and some change, you know, but you can wait at the drop, man. Please, man, target up something to eat, man. If you guys got a lot of time, you don't have to cancel, go to a store. You know, if you guys don't have money, see what you can't conjure up, man. It's not hard to leave, man. Just, you know, 
don't have any equipment in my hands. So I go about my business, canvas the rest of my night, and I did tell them, uh, make sure you keep a tally of your knocks. That's all you have to do. Every time you knock on the door, put a notch down. Because at the end of the night, I don't want you to, for your sake, to have to rifle through your papers. It's a headache, counting all those knocks over. You know, so just keep a knock tally. It's the only thing we need you to do, make it easier for me, make it easier for everybody else in the band. And uh, at the end of the night, everybody meets up. We were right on time. We were actually about five or ten minutes early. Put emphasis on going to go get them. Everybody had their knocks tallied. So I get in the van. Everybody gives me their numbers. I asked Tom and Eric. I was like, this is exactly my tone, too. I'm like, Tom, Eric, you guys got your numbers tallied. We ain't do it. Oh, come on. You can't. That's the only thing I asked you to do, guys. Um, we got a good 15, maybe 25-minute drive back to the office, depending on how traffic is. That's more than enough time to count up your knocks. I'm cool. Don't sweat it, man. You guys have plenty of time. Just as soon as you're done with your numbers, give me your knock summary and pass up your walk packets and an extra lit. That's exactly how I said it. So this still giving me grief about this, that, and I think, rah, 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 rah. And um, they get home. They end up getting let go for their inaction. You know, that's either you're there. In fact, I didn't know what was said about me at the time. Now, the next day, I come in. I'm talking to um, our CD, and Brandon Kobe tells me, man, yeah, that guy, uh, Eric, he, he, was, he was a fucking asshole, man. I was like, well, what do you mean? He was like, uh, I don't know if you're going to feel comfortable hearing what he said about you, but basically what he said is that, dude, he didn't feel comfortable. He didn't think it, it was right to have a black field manager that talked white. He was like, he just, he was really pissed about you being the FM. Like, man, he sounded like, he sounded like he talked too white. I felt like he was condescending to me. He didn't use that exact term. He felt like, um, like I thought that I was on a high horse and this, that, and the other thing. And it was really just a slap in the face. Because this isn't the first time that I've heard this tune. I'm never in my entire life going to ever apologize for being educated, for liking to speak well, you know, and for being scholastically smart and street smart. You know, I have, I am who I am, and I'm never going to be anyone else. I just hate the fact that since the, as far back as I can remember, I'm too black to be white. I'm too white to be black. That's a hell of a fucking stigma. You know, like, um, I'm not worried about fitting in, it just can be annoying when there are specific scenarios where that's the case. Like, people always confuse me, nobody knows what damn gender I am. I was like, dude, I'm half black, half Brazilian. I don't have any white in me, I just like pronouncing my E's and R's, man, can you blame me for that? I mean, sometimes if I have a little bit too much Grey Goose and Cranberry Juice, I'll let the E's and R's turn into A-H's, that's about it, man. Nothing's gonna stop that. I just hate the fact that that's the way it is. Like, the people that know me know how great of a person I am. I hate it when I get that. But like, I'm introduced to some, like a stranger on the street at the bus stop. I'm not gonna go up to you in front because I see a group of, uh, of black kids sitting there at the bus stop kicking it and browsing it. You know, I ain't gonna go up to them. If I need a cigarette because I don't have one, I'm not gonna go up to them like, bro, let me get a smoke, dog. I'm like, hey dude, do you have a cigarette? And people look at me like, who is this white boy in my face? I was like, dude, that's really offensive. I grew up in Detroit, Michigan. You know, it's like, it's about as low income area as you get. But I've been like this since I was a child. I was raised by really phenomenal parents who put a lot of emphasis on how important it is to grow up. You know, having good mannerisms, having good grammar, being okay. scholastically successful. So, okay. But I've been catching hell like that since I was a kid, but at the same time, uh, I've gotten help from people in white areas like that too. When I go to a door and I'm like, how you doing? My name is Steven Morrison. I work in America. I have found two five good jobs here in Ohio. Especially uh, Ohio because Ohio is number two for me. And they're looking at me just amazed. And I feel condescending when people tell me, where are you from? You speak so well. And it's something to trade mission. I was born in this country. And I got that at Brewers Bagels. I worked in an establishment very similar to this. It was the first time that I got that. This lady, she was a regular. She came in like almost every day for about four or five months. And she comes in, she gets her and does things. Like, yeah, can I ask you a question? I'm like, yeah, what is it, Kathy? She's like, where are you from? Were you born in this country? I mean, because you're a very cute man. I don't mean to offend you, but you just speak so well. Where are you from? Detroit, Michigan. Yeah. It's just, it gets really old and sometimes it gets annoying. But I've learned to take it as a compliment now because, 
you know, 10, 15 years from now, when I've developed myself as the person I want to be, headed to a career, you know, networking, wanting to be a writer, these are all tools that I'll be able to utilize Absolutely. to better myself. So everybody out there who remembers this phase, if you see this, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it big. And to hell with anybody who just can't seem to endow themselves with the uh, social sensitivity to realize that they're all people, all walks of life, who are going to conduct themselves the way they conduct themselves. I'm not going to look down at somebody because they come from a low income area, speak broken ass slang. Some of the cool people I've met in my entire life come from the most foulest places of the earth. But, you know, a road can grow in concrete and vice versa. You know? But really, I think you didn't say it in so many words, and please, you know, don't let me put words in your mouth. But maybe, yeah, why don't I turn it into question? Why don't you speak a little bit, you know, I guess briefly, since you've, you've said pretty much what I'm thinking, but in a way for me, I would simply put it like, there's choice in the matter, right? Like there's a choice somehow that you made, right? And how do you feel about that? Um, Saying it in that terms, like it can, it, that that can be a little controversial. No, no that just can be controversial. What you mean about the choice is, like, what do you mean by, like, really, there's a choice, there's a choice, there's always a choice in every choice. How, I mean, how you speak to people. Um, that's because it wasn't necessarily, I mean, it wasn't better in our house, and we're strongly encouraged to, you know, talk as you can, make yourself sit up straight, kind of a house. But my brothers did. Both my brothers are, for lack of better ways to put it, fucking retarded. But, you know, I... Not literally, like... No, not like literally slow. Disabled. Okay. They're just... They they don't care, dude. They're really slobber, okay. really All right. ignorant people. Hello. I love them to death, but they're goobers, and they don't got <laughs> that right. I don't even use that word. <laughs> it was a personal choice, and I'll tell you what made that what made me make that personal choice. The first time I fell in love, and I realized that it was a lot cooler to be smart than it was to be cool. That's something wow. my dad wasn't always around, but my dad did tell me something that will always stick with me. He told me two things: take care of your teeth, and I want you to be a smart kid in class. Tell you something now, because I'm not cool. I'm not cool because I spent too much time time trying to be cool. And being cool in school didn't pay off in the long run. So I want you to make a promise to yourself that when a teacher in, in class asks you a question, that you're gonna be able to put your hand up and in a well-spoken manner be able to answer that teacher. And he said that to me once, and uh, it didn't really resonate until I met a girl in his class that I liked. And um, you know, all these jocks and skater kids, punkers and metalheads, all these thugs and crap what I was trying to talk to her. She was really popular. And um, they just never appealed to this girl. And I never wondered why, but she sat down to me one day. And I was just being myself, you know. And she was talking to me. I was had a really nice conversation. Talked to her the same way I would talk to you right now. And uh, she dug me, man. She was like, I like the fact that you don't put up fronts and stuff like that. And you just talk really well. You seem really smart, you seem really nice, you know, you want to go hang out sometime, and, you know, that pretty much, that was pretty much like the catalyst, I think I was in the third or fourth grade, you know, when I realized that, yeah, it can benefit people, I mean, not just for the sole purpose of, um, you know, having a girl like you, but yeah. people are more responsive to you, uh, Yeah. with a demeanor like that, you know. That's so I just made it a point, even when I did screw up in class, I did like to, um, it became like a social thing to me after a while, like it started irking me when people didn't even turn out words right, stuff like that, it's just the way I am. That's cool that you can point that out, a lot of people have a hard time pointing to even a period of time, if not one or two instances, you know, what was formative for them, so that's really, really awesome, uh, it shows um, that you're, you really do take it all in as you go along. Yeah, well my unofficial fiance, Rebecca, um, she knows and she kinda hates it now, but I have a phone call. I don't know how I do, but I remember days, dates, years, hours, minutes, 
I just have a phenomenal memory. I have no idea how. So that's kind of a gift in itself, too. I want to thank you for the opportunity, man. It's kind of like a form of therapy for me. Yeah. A lot of things, a lot of questions that nobody really ever asked me. I mean, that's not really necessarily cool. like you asked me the question, just more so the opportunity to just man, talk to somebody. Yeah. Like it's pretty cool. I've got a couple more questions, if you don't mind. So, um, as far... What are your thoughts on... Some people would say, oh, that's that's uh, that's a problem with the society, the man. It's it's more of the negative people doing this to me. The fact that I can't get ahead in a career and talk the something. way that I want to talk. And I'm gonna put this as, as as simple as I possibly can. A white person, a black person, an Asian person, and nobody in the history of me being alive has ever stopped me from doing anything but myself. All right, now, I'm a firm believer now that nobody can make you feel a certain way. Like when someone says, oh, that person, he made me mad. No, something happened and you chose to be mad. You know? I'm not going to let anybody affect my demeanor. And if the words you made me ever comes out of my mouth again, I have the right to be a bitch. Like, <laughs> I don't believe really anybody can make me feel shit. I love the way I feel. I love the person that I am. And considering the tribulations that people prior to me, generations before, like mm. segregation and things of that nature, then you can probably get away with that card. I mean, it was very valid. Probably. Putting it in perspective, too. But... In this day and age, if you were born after 1985 and you say that somebody pro prohibited you from doing something based on race, like, all right, let's put it like this. If I want to open up my own coffee shop and um, for whatever reason, by coincidence, the person that prohibited me happened to be a white person at the time. And even if they did, for whatever reason, prohibited me from opening my coffee shop based on my race and like the race that I was, guess what? I'm gonna open up a coffee shop six blocks down. And the person that's probably gonna let me open that coffee shop might be a white person, might be a black person. If somebody stops you from doing one thing, don't conceive the notion that you're not gonna be able to turn right back around, try again. Now, my dad told me that a crazy person is somebody that does the same thing over and over and over again, expecting different results and failing, but respecting different results. That's the epitome of a crazy person. Sometimes it's okay to be crazy because sometimes I've tried something, failed, tried something, failed, tried something, failed, tried something, failed, and I was expecting the same results. But at the same time, if it's for the positive, to yield positive results, it's totally okay to go completely fucking bonkers. And don't stop till you yield that positive result. So nobody can really prohibit you from doing anything, whether it's, you know, um, becoming the president of the United States or... Uh, Obama. Obama. <laughs> or anything. You know, if you want to do something, by golly, you can do it. It's 2008, man. Join the 21st century. So, um... I mean, with regards to that, one of my favorite examples, I just want to share some stuff that I've learned along the way to just sort of add to your, you know, information that you can talk about in your life because you're clearly moving on to great things. Uh, Winston Churchill said, um, I'm, I didn't get enough sleep last night, so my recall of... My recall of quotes is awful today. Um, I, I'm not sure if he said, is it power? Something like true power, real power, um, or no, success. Success comes from going from, uh, from failure to failure without a loss of enthusiasm. You know, you know, people were against him when, in his policies. He he had an uphill battle with his policies, and he is definitely can take credit for you know saving the the free Western world, you know, and defending it against you know fascism and um, doing a lot for England's cause and bringing America into it. 
you know, he's, he's to credit for a lot of that. And uh, he got turned down all the time on his road. And Thomas Edison, another example, 10,000 different attempts to get the light bulb to work, you know. What he said about that. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you're you like you said, you're doing something positive. You know, you want to contribute something, and you're gonna try. I mean, Gandhi overcame. He just kept doing it and kept doing it and kept doing it and kept talking and got turned down from his own people. And then you just keep doing something that you know is right, and you take a stand. You draw the right people to you and then it'll infect you, you know? It, it'll infect everybody when you, you hit on to something that you know is there, that you know inspires people, and you just keep doing it. Inspiration, like my life is just a series of catalysts. Because the catalyst is the embryonic stage of a phase, and then you go through, you know, the middle, the beginning, the end, and the end is just simply the beginning of something else. Now, if you keep moving forward in positive regard, like, you know, you don't have to necessarily have a plan for what you want to do in life. What's great is knowing that you want to do something with your life. Sorry. I can't tell how much time this thing has. Uh, it's so relevant, man. What matters is that up front of everything, I would really like to have God not much us. and put out there for anyone who cares to listen to what has been established. Hopefully somebody will take you know, something I said into consideration. Absolutely. Do you have any other questions? Fire away. Um, I like your some of your specific memories from being out on the field, like one or two best or worst interactions. I can give you the best and the worst as briefly as I possibly can. I'm gonna start with the best experience. It's nothing really you know, like life changing, but it was phenomenal because it was the first and only time that it happened. And it was very recently, it was not even a week ago, it was when the temperature was dropped to like, you know, the mid 40s yeah. outside. It was really fucking cold. Nice. And um, I was ill prepared and have enough clothes on. I had on this dainty ass jacket. <laughs> and I had, and um, I'm walking through a predominantly Republican area. And I'm talking on the phone with my old lady, complaining about how cold I am and how the chances of me being able to canvas up a cup of tea, some hot chocolate, some coffee, are probably non-existent. It's not going to happen. Not in this area, you know. So I told her, all right, goodbye. I'm just going to hit the rest of my turf. I was really oh, fucking jerk about it because I was so mad about the area I was in, the turf in. And um, not even three houses down. You know, I've been out there for a good three and a half hours. I only had an hour and 20 minutes left. I was just about over it. You know, because I was just door after my face getting slammed, after door after face getting slammed. And um, I met this couple. I see their picture in here, and I'm going to save the picture of that family for her, as long as I have this phone. They were really nice to me. They invited me in. I was looking for a girl named Phoebe Violet. Mm-hmm. It's a crazy name, but it turned out that she wasn't eligible because she was a minor. But both her parents were home, and I explained to them why she was in our database, why we were talking to her, you know. You know, told them that whoever had initially signed her up as a member should have been fired, you know, because we have a zero tolerance for people, you know, doing stuff like that. But they just liked the way I was as a person. Like, man, you seem like a pretty nice guy. You need anything, man? Like, it's cold out there. You want some gloves? Or you guys are like, I'll take a cigarette as long as you don't tell my old lady. And I was like, well, come on in, man. And he's like, rooting around, gives me a cigarette. He's like, you know what, man? Take a couple more, give me like three cigarettes. I'm putting them in my pocket, and I'm putting these cigarettes in my pocket. Um, his wife comes in and uh, asks if I was cold, so she offers me some coffee. I'm sitting there thinking she's, thinking she's gonna get like a small, like, like coffee cup of coffee. She goes inside the kitchen, takes a pot of coffee, gets this humongous, like it was maybe about yay around and about that tall, this humongous plastic like stein of coffee <laughs> went to the brim dumped a bunch of like you like sugar I was like I like a little bit of uh, coffee with my sugar so she's dumb sugar a bunch of cream sat there had some coffee the guy's like oh you need something to put those cigarettes in man it's like yeah please that would be greatly appreciated he's like I don't have an empty pack it goes to the garbage for me he's like nope that one's messed up that's fucked up <laughs> that's fucked up that looks good 
put the cigarettes Whoa. in there. Um, it was just really phenomenal. Um, he liked my phone case cover. I don't know if what you can part of town? He thought that it was a, a Buckeye leaf. There you totally go. Like that. I thought that was funny. But they were just such phenomenal people. And that's when I realized that I had to put my demeanor back in check. You know, because I pride myself on the fact that I wasn't turf headed. And when I actually found myself slipping and being very much turf headed, you know, it was a smack in the face. Like, God told me, like, you know what, man, they're phenomenal people in all areas of the world. You know, from the slums of Harlem to the bouge of Cincinnati, Ohio, to a rainforest somewhere in, like, Thailand. You know, phenomenal people are everywhere. And I met those people that day, and I, that's going to stick with me, man. They lived in like, these people very much had no reason. They didn't want to vote for Obama. They were not Obama supporters. They were very much to the bone that came Palin. But they were extremely, wow. extremely That's kind hot. to me. <laughs> That's extremely awesome. kind to me. And I'm gonna take that with me for life, man. Like I said, there's things about this job, things I've experienced, things I've learned. I'm gonna be able to utilize the rest of my life. So that's pretty awesome.